Hello and welcome to this presentation on direct care and administrative activities for Medicaid school-based services. This is Masuma with the Medicaid SBS Technical Assistance Center. We're excited to host this third presentation along with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the U.S. Department of Education. For today's webinar, we will cover the objectives and discuss more details around coalition work. Then we will move into a discussion around direct care services and administrative activities. Understanding how this all plays into the state claiming guidance, we will take a few minutes to look at the details that should be included in that valuable resource. We will conclude this session with a short Q&A and review some resources associated with the content of today's presentation. This webinar is intended to inform state Medicaid agencies and state educational agencies on action steps for their coalition to enhance Medicaid school-based services. We'll explore the appropriate services that should be considered understanding that these need to be consistent with your state plan amendment and identify areas for revision that should be outlined in the state's claiming guidance reflective of the Medicaid state plan and amendments. By the end of this webinar, you should be able to identify coalition work to inform the expansion of Medicaid SBS in your state, describe example data collection to inform the approach, describe the types of direct care services and administrative activities that states can provide under the Medicaid benefit and identify the components of a state's Medicaid SBS claiming guide that would be marked for revision or creation. In response to the horrific school shootings in Uvalde, Texas, Congress and President Biden developed the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, known as BSCA, that became law in June of 2022. The BSCA directed the Department of Health and Human Services to collaborate with the U.S. Department of Education to assist states on specific activities designed to increase access to school-based mental health services. Specifically, the law requires HHS and the Department of Education to issue guidance to state Medicaid agencies, local education agencies, and school-based entities to support the delivery of medical assistance to Medicaid and CHIP beneficiaries in school-based settings. Section 11003 of this act includes a directive to CMS to provide additional guidance to states on Medicaid SBS to increase access to Medicaid-funded school-based health services, including mental health services, reduce administrative burden, support federal compliance with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, requirements, ensure ongoing coordination and collaboration between HHS and the Department of Education, and provide information to state and LEAs on how to utilize funding to ensure payment under Medicaid for assistance provided in SBS. At the same time, CMS and ED were tasked to establish this technical assistance center that's designed to assist states, state Medicaid agencies, school districts, and state departments of education to provide assistance under Medicaid. The task of the technical assistance center is to reduce administrative burden and support school districts and school-based services for obtaining payment for Medicaid reimbursement and to ensure ongoing coordination between school districts regarding the provision and payment of Medicaid services. And one of the most important things was to provide direct assistance to rural and small schools that may have thought this was an activity that was just beyond their reach. For Medicaid SBS, BSCA specifically addresses establishing responsibility for interagency coordination between state agencies, providing SMAs and SEAs with technical assistance necessary for them to assist access Medicaid to provide SBS, a special rule that identifies that the requirements may be met through state statute or regulation, signed agreements, or other appropriate written methods. For school-based services, there is a specific responsibility for interagency coordination at the state level, and we want to use this opportunity to provide state Medicaid and education agencies with the technical assistance for them to access Medicaid to provide school-based services. We will spend a little bit more time on this concept in the following slides. With regards to interagency coordination, the chief executive officer or designee of a state must ensure that an interagency agreement is in effect. Interagency coordination is in effect between each non-educational public agency other than an education agency, which is obligated under federal or state law or assigned responsibility under state policy to pay for any services that are also considered special education or related services that are necessary for ensuring free and appropriate public education known as FAPE to children with disabilities within the state. The public agency must fulfill that obligation or responsibility to either directly or either directly or through contract or other arrangement and the SCA in order to ensure that all services as described above that are needed to ensure FAPE are provided. 
As you may know, there are two distinct groups of Medicaid enrolled children who can receive school-based services. Children who receive services under the federal special education law known as IDEA, and then all other children. For IDEA enrolled children, as a condition of receiving federal special education funds, a state must ensure that there are interagency agreements among the state education agency and the state Medicaid agency. And these agreements must ensure that Medicaid is the payer of first resort for IEP services for a student with a disability, that the state education agency must resolve any payment disputes so that there is no cost to the child's family, and that if Medicaid re reimburses the education system for any special education service, Medicaid is prohibited from reducing any Medicaid benefit available to the child, including benefits delivered under, Medi under a Medicaid waiver or through a managed care organization. For all other children, the BSCA encourages interagency agreements with the goal of expanding access to Medicaid services that can be delivered in a school-based setting. And this technical assistance center was designed to help states develop strategies to that end. And no, there's an obligation of non-educational public agencies to not disqualify an eligible service for Medicaid reimbursement because that service is provided in a school context. And with that, I will turn it over to Charlotte Steniger to talk about additional coalition work to get your state ready to expand Medicaid SBS. Thanks so much, Ms. Suma. Hi, folks. My name is Charlotte Stinninger, and I'm a member of the TAP support team, and I'm so happy to be presenting this information for you today. Now, as some of you may remember, during the last webinar, we discussed the initial steps of forming the coalition, and we wanted to take some time today to discuss some more of the intricate details of coalition work. To review, our webinar on getting started with Medicaid covered the comprehensive review and analysis and information dissemination of many resources, including a state's Medicaid plan, a state's Medicaid guidance for SBS, opportunities for the initiation or evolution of Medicaid SBS, health equity in schools, and understanding Medicaid managed care plans. And to be clear, interagency agreements between SEAs and SMAs related to IDEA services and Medicaid should be disseminated as well. And finally, we discuss building a coalition, introducing the steps for identifying key stakeholders, establishing coalition expectations, and ways of promoting coalition understanding. Recording and slide decks from this webinar is available on the Medicaid.gov website, and links to these resources can be found on the resource slide. Though we have discussed this before, we want to promote states to engage in the work to move it, to move to offering more health care services to students in schools. This can be an incremental move from only offering services to stay complying with IDA requirements to adding a, an additional service or two or even moving to a full expanded school-based service. What is important to remember is that states need to understand the goals and re requirements of Medicaid SBS as outlined in the Delivering Services in a School-Based Setting, a Comprehensive School-Based Guide to Medicaid Services and Administrative Claiming. This should lead states to consider what changes need to be made and to start drafting policies to allow for all Medicaid eligible students to receive medi medi medical care. And finally, most states should submit a state amendment plan for approval to fully expand school-based services. To start, it's important for a state to identify how it will evolve Medicaid SBS to increase medical access to students. Now, this is done by establishing the primary aim for the work. This action step is essential to inform the work ahead, and we see it as a joint effort between SMAs and SEAs informed by LEAs. It may require some additional groundwork to influence those who may not be in alignment. And gaining support to, to promote the initiative is critical and should include state legislative and financial leadership input and input from stakeholders such as teacher unions, primary care organizations, and associations for school-based health centers. Parent, teacher organizations, and advocate voices are also essential to be heard as well. Provider organizations like a state's association of school nurses is critical as well. This work should be informed by the comprehensive review and analysis that we reviewed in the webinar last month. An emphasis should be placed on the LEA work that defines the opportunities for the initiation or evolution of Medicaid SBS or a similar resource. Getting the perspective and input from multiple stakeholders 
will help define the aim of how your state will evolve Medicaid SBS to meet the healthcare needs of students in your state. In addition, states need to consider what their plan is to address the existing policies that currently support or limit Medicaid SBS. Now, we see this work as being the responsibility of all, SMAs, SCAs, and LEAs, as there would be policies that could impact Medicaid SBS at each level. Now, the coalition can create a cross-agency committee dedicated to this work, and that committee should determine which state policies related to Medicaid SBS need to be created or revised, identify priorities for state policy development or revision, identify resources that should inform the work, regulations, industry standards, and best practices, and determine the best methods for dissemination. The purpose for this effort is to increase understanding of policies is by increasing the understanding of policies in your state that need to be created and, and revised, as this work is critical to expanding and streamlining Medicaid reimbursement. But each of these action steps discussed so far will start with understanding the data that details what is happening in your state and how it needs to change. So let's take a few minutes about to talk about data collection and how that impacts this essential work. I'd like to start by talking about the basic elements of data collection. First, you start with a question. You identify what you need to know. And you can start with a broad question and then narrow it down to get to the specifics that you need. Then you wanna gather your team and assign roles. Consider who has the information or who knows the data the best. Determine who can lead primary and secondary data collection efforts. Then locate the data. Does the data exist? Determine where the data are to inform the response, secondary data collection, to the question, or if you need to gather the data yourself via primary data collection. Then determine the relevance of the data. Do the data help answer the question or provide context? And do you have additional secondary data sources or need to engage in primary data collection? Then consider the next phases. And finally, analyze the data. Is the data telling us what we need to know or what other data do we need? Specifically for Medicaid SBS, the data should be used to make the case for expansion and inform what additional services and providers may be needed. So the process for collecting the data may involve different initiatives and purposes, such as identifying unmet student health needs, understanding implementation of different payment methodologies, or identifying current school-based and non-school-based provider demographics. It may include different types of data collection. Now, I mentioned both primary and secondary data collection, so let's think about what those are. Primary data collection is the real-time data gathered via surveys, observations, questionnaires, or focus groups, or, or groups like that. Secondary data collection is really past data collected by someone else via publications, websites, reports, internal records, articles, etc. Now, and it may be completed in a number of phases. By identifying the data for collection, the coalition can start understanding the work moving forward. We see the accountability for this effort lies solely with the SMAs and SEAs. Consider previously collected data time studies, cost reports, fee-for-service or interim claims. Consider student and school level data, such as service frequency and duration data within IEPs, Section 504 plans, treatment plans or other healthcare plans, provider reports and service documentation. And state level data, such as community health needs assessments and public health plans. And for data sources and subject matters, think about reaching out to specialists within school districts, special education directors, directors of direct care providers, clinical leadership, including school nurse and medical directors, and the Medicaid SBS deputy director. And remember, to align the primary aim of the coalition, data collection should be targeted to gain understanding of where implementation and improvement efforts should be focused. Now let's look at, an, at this example. Between 2015 and 2019, the Colorado Department of Education and Colorado Department of Healthcare Policy and Financing made decisions to explore options to leverage the free care policy reversal and expand school-based Medicaid program 
to bring additional and sustainable federal funding to the state. This funding would allow the state and LEAs to effectively target limited resources and increase access to school health services. To take advantage of the new, of the new policy, Colorado needed to submit a SPA to CMS. However, before pursuing the SPA, state decision makers wanted to investigate what expanding their school-based Medicaid program to all Medicaid enrolled students would mean. So this happened in a few different phases here. In phase one, Colorado wanted to understand if it was financial, financially beneficial to the state to expand services to include non-IEP services and consider if expanding services would increase Medicaid reimbursement the state received for these services. A year later, they engaged in phase two to determine what expansion, what are the expansion opportunities and how would key pro programmatic requirements be met. And despite some of the findings from the early studies, Colorado sought out further information to better understand how alternative models like those in Massachusetts could be applied in Colorado to increase Medicaid access to students. This resulted in a third phase where a pilot study was conducted to test claiming methodology. The pilot found that in addition to serving students with IEPs, service providers were providing a significant number of free care services to Medicaid enrolled students. For example, nurses were spending 26% of their time providing services for students with IEPs and 18% of their time on services for Medicaid enrolled students without IEPs. Allowing these providers to bill for the free care services provided to students without IEPs could result in, a, in meaningful funding since they were spending a significant amount of time delivering these services. In examining the second cost, the second cost pool, the pilot aimed to identify how many services these, provi these providers deliver to all Medicaid enrolled students with and without IEPs. The pilot found that a master's level school psychologist delivered a significant amount, 23%, of services for students with IEPs and some, and some services for students who would be covered under Medicaid SBS expansion, about 6%. Expanding Medicaid to allow for claiming and reimbursement for the school psychologist would be impactful, assuming the providers met the Medicaid provider qualifications. At the time of the pilot, minimal Medicaid eligible services delivered by school psychologists were re being reimbursed by Medicaid. Using this data, Colorado calculated three different scenarios for expansion and the financial analysis of each. Colorado determined the best way to move forward was by using a SPA to lift the IEP restrictions. The program bills for all existing services delivered to all Medicaid enrolled students by the existing provider types and school psychologists. The analysis found that the state would receive $12 million in new federal Medicaid funds. Since that adoption, Colorado has reported continued increase of reimbursement spending and expansion of services, including full-time staff, health-related equipment and supplies, and mental and social-emotional health interventions. And with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to Nicole Clark to discuss direct care services and administrative activities. Thank you, Charlotte. As Charlotte mentioned, my name is Nicole Clark, and I'm a member of the CMS Medicaid SBS team. Thank you all again for joining us today for this presentation. Let's consider the coalition work to determine Medicaid coverable SBS by identifying how Medicaid coverable services and administrative activities can be integrated into Medicaid SBS programs beyond those covered by IDEA. Now, with consideration of specifically those Medicaid coverable services and administrative activities, these can include therapy, counseling, screening, nursing, outreach, and enrollment and care coordination. Billing considerations for provision of SBS includes ensuring that provision is happening through a Medicaid provider and regarding licensed disciplines, credentials and qualifications are considered. Now, there are options to not submit bills for each service. If you choose roster billing or PCPM, LEAs and states would not be required to submit a bill for each service to Medicaid. 
as long as the interim rates and payments are reconciled to actual costs at the end of the year. It's important to note that the infrastructure for capturing costs beyond IDEA often exists in LEAs, especially those already using a cost-based methodology, but even those with fee-for-service. The decisions around services and activities must start now to come into compliance by 2026, as by then there could be other priorities that need consideration. Therefore, many states are considering expanding their program to include billing for all Medicaid enrolled students and to add additional services and provider types to the list of covered benefits and services. Medical care service plans are not a requirement for Medicaid payment. However, they are helpful in tracking service provision and care planning objectives like treatment interventions and goals of care. Medicaid coverable services should be outlined with specifics for each student who receives these services. For IDEA students, this needs to be outlined in an IEP, and for non-IDEA students can be included in a medical care slash treatment service plan. These treatment plans should detail the type of services, frequency and duration, implementation, interventions, and modalities, and goals of care. Note, for the purpose of this concept, we will use the term treatment plan to identify both an IEP and or care slash treatment plan as we discuss this further in this presentation. The range of Medicaid coverable school-based services includes the following listed here. But please note for the EPSDT benefit, the services listed do not reflect all services provided under this benefit. Services must be directly related to the provision of Medicaid-covered services to a student enrolled in Medicaid and otherwise coverable in the 1905A of the Social Security Act. The services must be medically necessary as defined by the state. In a plans of care policy brief, this is defined as healthcare services or supplies that are needed to diagnose or treat an illness, injury, condition, disease, or its symptoms, and that meet accepted standards of medicine. The resource for this brief and more information regarding medical necessity can be found on the resources page at the end of this presentation. Understand that the Medicaid coverable services can be delivered to an individual or group and must be performed in the presence of the student. The services must be coverable services under the 1905A of the Social Security Act, and schools should work with the state to determine the specific services that are covered in, in the state. And lastly, it's important to note that the services should be provided by a qualified Medicaid provider. Now this slide includes a list of Medicaid coverable services, which can include therapies, counseling services, nursing services, and physician services. Now it's important to note that Medicaid coverable services include pre and post time activities when the state is not present including time to complete all paperwork related to the specific service, such as preparation of progress notes and translation of session notes. And this is only if translation is part of the rate paid for the services and not claimed separately. Please note that there has been allowance for a provider to translate or interpret evaluations as a service. And translation into another language can also be claimed as an admin claim, but it has to be claimed only once. Review of evaluation, testing, slash observation, and planning activities for the therapy session or completion of billing activities. And examples of pre and post time activities include things like updating the medical slash health related service goals and objectives of the treatment care plan, interpretation of evaluation results and our preparation of written evaluations when student slash the client is not present. It's important to understand what is not considered Medicaid coverable services. 
These include things like administration of first aid, screening services conducted by non-qualified providers, mental health services conducted by non-qualified providers, nursing services conducted by non-qualified providers. Many may generally include any cost of general public health initiatives that are made available to all persons, like screening for lice, provision of a medically necessary service to someone who is not a student, and note this change, provider travel to and from the Medicaid service. To clarify, this includes any provider tra travel regardless of where the care is being provided and services provided to a student when another health plan or program is responsible for covering these services. This is wrapped around the third party liability. Now, Medicaid and CHIP can pay schools for the cost of administrative activities that support the provision of medical services covered under the Medicaid or CHIP state plan, including outreach enrollment and application assistance. This is really important activity for schools to engage in right now because so many kids and families are going through eligibility reviews under unwinding and losing coverage because they need help navigating the application process. In addition to caring about kids having coverage, schools will have a higher Medicaid enrollment ratio and therefore more revenue for claiming if kids stay enrolled. Translation services, program planning, policy development, and interagency coordination related to medical services, transportation when not provided as an optional medical service, referral coordination and monitoring of CHIP or Medicaid services, Medicaid or CHIP related training, and now school districts must enter into an interagency agreement with state Medicaid agencies to conduct Medicaid administrative activities. State Medicaid agencies that intend to claim for allowable administrative activities must have an approved public assistance cost allocation plan, as well as an SBS claiming time study implementation plan approved by CMS. And it's important to note that states do not reconcile to costs for administrative activity claiming. There are some important considerations for administrative activities that we want to keep in mind. First, a time study is the primary mechanism for identifying and categorizing Medicaid administrative activities performed by LEAs. The time study serves as the basis for developing claims for the cost of administrative activities that may be properly reimbursed under Medicaid. Activities must directly relate to the proper and efficient administration of the state Medicaid program and be supported by adequate documentation. And note, the guidance has a full description of allowable and non-allowable administrative activities for time studies. Please see Appendix 3, Activity Codes, within the guide for more information. The range of allowable administrative activities include the following, but keep in mind this is not an exhaustive list. Arranging transportation for students in Medicaid covered services, arranging for and or providing translation services to facilitate access to Medicaid covered services, only if translation services are not included as part of the rate paid for the service, medical program planning, policy development, and interagency coordination, medical slash Medicaid related training and professional development, referrals, coordination, and monitoring of Medicaid services, and outreach activities that focus on Medicaid services or eligibility requirements, and ensuring that eligible students are not in inadvertently unenrolled due to Medicaid unwinding. Now, Medicaid unwinding happened at a, as a result of the public health emergency ending. This is where students become unenrolled in Medicaid. It is essential that schools track en enrollment. CMS sent a letter on August 30th, 2023 to all states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands requiring them to determine and report whether they have a systems issue that inappropriately disenrolls children and families 
even when the state had information indicating that they remained eligible for Medicaid and CHIP coverage. There is an indication as of the date of that letter that 30 states report having this system issue. As a result, to avoid CMS taking further action, all 30 states were required to pause procedural disenrollments for impacted people unless they could ensure all eligible people are not improperly disenrolled due to this issue. More information regarding Medicaid unwinding can be found on the resources slide at the end of this presentation. Just as important, it's essential to understand what types of administrative activities are not covered by Medicaid. Examples include outreach that focuses on federal or state benefit programs other than Medicaid, such as SNAP or food stamps, activities that are part of the medical service, such as completing service documentation notes after a service has been provided, activities related to the operation of a provider facility, such as supervision or training of a provider, and referrals to non-Medicaid enrolled community providers. It's important for states to understand service provision. Understanding options for providing SBS is an essential part in your Medicaid state plan. Consider state regulations and state Medicaid program requirements regarding provider qualifications. Providers furnishing the services must be enrolled in Medicaid or CHIP. And to receive payment, SBS providers must be qualified providers for those services. LEAs need clear guidance on what types of providers a school can use and how to access non-school providers as needs arise. More information on provider qualification requirements will be made available by CMS in the upcoming months to assist with this effort. Now, we have talked a lot today about Medicaid coverable services, but we do see there could be a few stumbling blocks to getting this all in place, especially for Medicaid SBS expansion. Some school districts may have scarce resources to provide Medicaid SBS beyond what is required through a child's IEP slash Section 504 plan. There could be challenges around high student to provider ratios, qualified provider shortage issues, or competitive compensation. In addition, some students may have providers who administer the same type of services outside of the school. Therefore, it's important to establish communication pathways between schools, parents, and community-based providers, and care coordination is key to prevent healthcare gaps and duplication. Now, consider different service delivery models, such as telehealth and partnerships, may provide some solutions. States may want to identify opportunities to integrate telehealth to enhance SBS but there are a few things to consider. The provider furnishing the services must be enrolled in Medicaid or CHIP, must consider state regulations and policies regarding the use of telehealth, and note that additional overhead costs associated with delivering telehealth services may need to be considered as well. For those of you who may be less familiar, school-based telehealth uses telecommunication, including interactive video conferencing and store and forward transmissions to deliver a variety of healthcare and other services to children while they are present in school settings. Now they must be a covered Medicaid service for a Medicaid eligible child provided by a Medicaid qualified provider, and states generally are not required to submit a SPA to authorize telehealth as a service delivery mechanism for covered services. Now, please note, if a state plans to reimburse for telehealth delivered services differently from the services delivered face-to-face, -face, it may be required to submit a SPA to authorize that type of payment. Telehealth delivered services may benefit students' health in a number of ways, as listed here on the slide. Provider licensing and credentialing requirements should be reviewed, especially for out-of-state providers, and we have provided a resource on the resource slide to assist with this. 
States may pay providers for additional costs associated with delivering telehealth services. This could include overhead costs with telehealth technology, set up for sites may be incorporated into the fee for service rates, and state Medicaid slash CHIP agencies should be mindful of applicable privacy laws when covering telehealth services and should review their provided provider licensure and credentialing requirements to evaluate whether they need to be modified to allow for telehealth service delivery, particularly in the event the state Medicaid slash CHIP agency wishes to make payment for services furnished by providers located out of state who furnish services to individuals within the state. Telehealth was an important tool for providing IEP students access to Medicaid coverable services during the COVID-19 pandemic, whereas states must de determine that parameters by which telehealth should be considered an appropriate methodology for service delivery now that school is back in person. At the LEA level, care teams should discuss the clinical appropriateness of providing IEP services via telehealth. IEP slash IFSP and other non-IEP treatment care plan documentation requirements for telehealth modalities should clearly include type of service to be delivered via telehealth, frequency and duration of telehealth modality, and the location of service. And remember, service provision via telehealth should be discussed at IEP meetings. Another service delivery model example is that of partnerships. These involve non-school-based Medicaid enrolled providers who are not employed or contracted by the school. These providers are able to bill Medicaid directly and seek reimbursement through their regular methods. The Medicaid state plan would need to include details regarding partnerships. State-level guidance regarding partnerships can be very helpful. And this guidance would address how communities address data sharing or contracting with managed care organizations, conducting statewide assessments that provide communities with the data needed to inform partnerships, and improving policies that create a supportive school health environment. These partnerships may require a memorandum of understanding to help clarify roles and responsibilities. We provided a link regarding MOUs on the resource slide of this presentation. In looking at partnerships, SEAs and SMAs can work together to identify healthcare providers to engage in the provision of Medicaid SBS. For example, hospitals and federally qualified health centers already bill Medicaid for services delivered by their providers, and that process would be extended to cover services delivered to students enrolled in Medicaid. By entering into these partnerships, schools can expand access to needed services without having to use scarce district resources to do so, and without taking on any of the administrative and paperwork burdens. State agency leaders also can be the catalyst for building an improved system of care. Agencies can partner directly with school districts and offer a new vision of how schools can improve physical and behavioral health. Mental health and alcohol and substance use services may be provided through collaborations between state agencies and school districts. Building a partnership between a school or LEA and a healthcare provider takes time and involves the development of a shared understanding of the scope of services and clear guidelines around data sharing, parental consent, and documentation. And remember, parents have choices of where their children receive services. While the logistics can feel overwhelming, the process can start with a phone call between interested parties. Once there is an interest to work together, an institutional commitment, the right people can be brought together to formalize the agreement. HRSA supported health centers often referred to as community health centers or federally qualified health centers are community-based and patient-led organizations that deliver comprehensive, culturally competent, high quality primary health care, as well as supportive services such as health education, translation and transportation to the nation's medically underserved communities. 
including populations experiencing homelessness, agricultural workers, and residents of public housing. They provide comprehensive primary care services, including behavioral health, mental health and substance use disorder, and oral health services. By emphasizing coordinated care management of patients with multiple health care needs and the use of key quality improvement practices, health, health centers increase access to care and help reduce health disparities. There are approximately 1,400 health centers that operate more than 14,000 service delivery sites in every state, U.S. territory, and the District of Columbia. Health centers can partner with schools to determine how best to meet the healthcare needs of the students in the school. For more information, find this link on our resource slide that's listed here as well. I will now turn it back over to Charlotte Stinninger to talk about the considerations of updating and revising your state's claiming guidance. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nicole. SMAs and SEAs will want to work together to update and revise the claiming guidance to ensure alignment and compliance. Essential to this practice, we see the following occurring. Reviewing and updating provider billing manuals, ensuring that billing and documentation requirements for providers are clear and concise and can reasonably be met by the providers furnishing the SBS. Conducting frontline training to SBS providers on Medicaid documentation standards and auditing processes processes, and ensuring LEAs have adequate funding to support necessary medical bill billing infrastructure and training. When such investments and activities are undertaking as allowable Medicaid administrative activities, federal matching funds are available. Essential to this work, we see LEAs benefiting from having clear instructions and guidance on how to implement Medicaid SBS. SMAs are responsible for updating the guidance. And claiming guidance should be the culmination of the work of the coalition in determining the services, providers, and billing methodology decisions for the state. It should identify what is covered and not covered and options for, for service delivery. The purpose of this work is to help SBS providers operating in schools know what's expected of them when participating in the program. This is the this state claiming this state's claiming guidance documents and instructions and directions to LEAs to inform the provision and billing procedures for Medicaid SBS. Typically, this guidance outlines a number of topics, including those listed here. I'll live, I'll give you a minute to take a look at these as listed. Okay. With regards to who is responsible for which components and injunctive activities to support the claiming guidance updates, let's consider the following. At the SMA level, it's important to share the most relevant federal guidance to assist in the expansion of Medicaid SBS. This includes defining the directive administration, administrative services, service language to align with the Medicaid state plan or SPA. Define and instruct on provider enrollment activities, qualification requirements, and associated processes. Define Medicaid eligibility requirements and the time study implementation plan. Include description of audit and compliance review processes and support SEA, SEAs and LEAs in the administration of Medicaid SBS. More specifically, the SMAs need to define the provider requirements for eligibility in the state's plan, but the SEAs will be the ones that understand the model their school uses for delivering services and the types of providers that operate in that model, and any state education-specific requirements for provider licensing. So both parties need to define provider requirements, but from different angles. With regards to the time study implementation plan, whereas the SMAs would decide on the methodology, the SEAs need to include supplemental guidance documentation to its LEAs and schools about the, about the LEA and school level employee responsibilities to implement parts of the time study and billing system. A lot of the role with regards to claiming for SEAs falls in the realm of supporting the LEAs. The LEAs utilize guidance in the execution of the plan and communicate questions and challenges in plan implementation. Now, with regards to time study implementation plans, CMS requires the state Medicaid agencies submit an SBS claiming time study implementation plan, also called the Medicaid Administra Administrative Claiming Plan. That plan provides a comprehensive description of the mechanisms and processes for claiming administrative claim 
Medicaid administrative costs for conducting time studies for administrative and direct service costs. The time study claiming implementation plan details the SBS activities, including both administrative activities and direct medical care services provide by, provide, performed by the LEAs and the methods used for out, to allocate SBS activities and services to the Medicaid program. The time study implementation plan contains the elements needed for approval in order for states to initiate SBS claiming. Now, the elements of the time study implementation plan that should be outlined in the state's claiming guide describes how the plan should be conducted at the school level. This typically includes a description of administrative and direct services payable by Medicaid, interagency agreements, descriptions of the different cost pools, the source of non-federal share, a sample design or random moments time study description, the treatment of indirect cost and monitoring processes. Once the plan for claiming guide revisions is determined, it's important to consider these additional general approaches. Announce the plan to revise the guidance and provide a date for when the anticipated release of the guidance will happen. Include a date of revision to indicate with the last time the guidance was updated. Use a summary page to identify what guidance was revised, added, or removed. Describe the reasons for the revisions and reinforce the vision for the Medicaid SBS program. Hyperlink the sections and subsections to allow for easier navigation and include appendices, glossaries, and acronym lists. As most of you know, dissemination of the state's updated claiming guidance is essential to promote adoption, and many states use, use websites or specific web pages dedicated to this. Here are some basic tips on how to make the most of your efforts. Announce the changes to the guidance and upload your new versions. Offer training and educational opportunities, provide additional resources, and offer emails and help desk links inform and information regarding our Technical Assistance Center. To assist with your efforts, we provided links to three different states claiming guides for your references. These links will be included in the reference page at the end of this presentation. Informed by the new guidance and with the goal of assisting SMAs and SEAs in understanding the work of their coalition to enhance advance Medicaid SBS, we reviewed the following. The work to establish the primary aim for states to advance Medicaid SBS, examples of states who have engaged in the advancement of Medicaid SBS, direct services and administrative activities that could be considered a part of the state's plan to increase access to Medicaid SBS, and elements of a state's claiming guidance that should be marked for revision and enhancement. That's all we have for now. Join us for our next webinar on November 14th from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time. The topic for that webinar will be understanding rate setting and cost rate interim payment methodologies for direct SBS. It will include identifying the requirements for billing and claiming, considerations for developing payment methodology, cost-based and rate-based me reimbursement methodology, and a panel where states will share their experiences in determining payment methodologies. And with that, I'd like to turn this back over to Nicole, who would facilitate a brief Q&A session. Thank you, Charlotte. I see that we had a question in the chat wrapped around when the slides, if the presentation slides will be made available. The slides will be made available following today's webinar on the Medicaid.gov website. We also will be sending out an announcement when, the, when those slides go live, as well as the recording from today's presentation. Please feel free to enter any questions that you have within the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. So we had a few questions already answered um, that were previously asked, but we'll go ahead and we'll leave the line open just for a few more moments to see if anyone else has any questions. If you have questions following today's presentation, please email us at schoolbaseservices at cms.hhs.gov, um, and we'll be more than happy to assist you with any questions that you have. Go ahead and give it just one more moment to see if anyone else has any questions. 
before we wrap up today's presentation. As I see, we have no more questions coming in. Then we just wanna thank you all again for joining today's webinar. Um, again, the slides, a Q&A, and the recording of today's presentation will be made available on the medicaid.gov site. Um, oh, I see we actually have one coming in. We'll go ahead and take a look at that, but thank you all who else has joined for joining today's webinar.